The history of life on Earth has been a history of interaction between living things and their surroundings. Only within the present century has one species, man, acquired the power to significantly alter the living environment. Conservation is the wise use of plant, animal, land, and water resources. In every state, men and women of conservation agencies try to maintain the balance between man and his natural world. We have to protect aquatic environments from pollution if we're to assure the survival of native fishes. We get the most valuable information from the stream animals that live on the bottom, helgramites, crayfish, and insects like stoneflies and mayflies. These are the best indicators of water quality because they don't move very fast or move as far as fish do. They're very sensitive to pollution. They'll die from pollutants that may not have much effect at all on fish. And the absence of these animals from a stream is a good indicator that there's been some sort of pollution. We're only able to sample the streams a few times each year, so chemical analysis won't tell us much unless there's a constant flow of pollutants. In a stream, toxic chemicals may flow downstream during the night and not be found on a sample taken the next morning. If we're lucky enough to catch the flush of poison as it passes, then we can determine chemically what was present. But usually samples are collected too late to be of any great value. All told, our objective is to find out who and what is polluting a stream and to try to stop it. Stream life will regenerate in time, so if the source of pollution is stopped, there will eventually be aquatic life in that stream again.
Mike, I've been involved in paddlefish research down here since 1958. I came down today to see how the paddlefish population has been doing in recent years. What was the catch this year? This year was uh, considerably lower than last year, and uh, last year was a little bit less than what we had the previous year, so we're seeing a, a slow decline in the numbers of fish taken by fishermen. How is the size of the fish doing? Uh, some of these fish this year were... As man uh, alters the environment, the conservation department must step in and monitor these changes to see how they affect fish and wildlife. This dam, for example, blocked off the spawning grounds of one of the most unusual and largest of the freshwater fish in America, paddlefish. A holdover from a family of ancient freshwater fish, the paddlefish was formerly abundant in much of the Mississippi River Valley but has undergone a drastic decline since 1900. In order to save the paddlefish, we had to see if they could be raised artificially in a conservation hatchery, something no one had ever done before. Today, we are successfully growing paddlefish and releasing them on the other side of the dam. I think the hatchery probably saved the paddlefish in the Osage River system. Keeping tabs on the wildlife in the state is one of the ways we can protect them from changes in their environment. Often hundreds of man hours are spent in the field tracking wildlife with radio telemetry equipment. Especially native wildlife that we are trying to reintroduce into areas where they once lived. Most species we study can be fitted with a collar that sends out a radio signal. Otters have presented a special problem. They have such large necks that collars will not stay on. So we've had to surgically implant the transmitter in the animal's side. The otter usually has no ill effects. We want to learn more about what they eat, where they travel, and if they are surviving in their new homes. The information we gather through the radio tracking of otters and other wildlife will help assure their survival in an ever-changing environment. working up, John, for food plot purposes. Looks pretty good to me, Jim. Uh, it's dried up enough that I think... My primary responsibility as a conservation agent is in the protection of the fisheries and wildlife resources of the state. At the same time, I work very closely with landowners in providing additional habitat and food for wildlife to sustain them through the winter months. This wildlife food plot program provides not only for the game species, but the non-game species as well. Soil Conservation Service up there, I think they give you the best idea about that. I think one good thing about having it right here, you know, like we planned here, I think we're gonna have uh, an awful lot of usage again this year from waterfowl, you know, being this close to the river.
In the past, forests were often cut without considering the overall impact on the environment. Today, we must work closely with landowners in developing a forestry plan that minimizes soil erosion and benefits all species of wildlife. You uh, also have an interest in the wildlife? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Part of it. Part of it. Do you do any hunting? No, actually. During the initial survey, we evaluate existing trees and recommend saving a wide variety of species. This provides a year-round food supply for wildlife and helps reduce problems with disease and insects. Along stream banks, we suggest limited cutting. This helps to protect the soil and the aquatic environment. Jim, this is an example of what I mentioned before, where you've got a dead tree. There wouldn't be any reason you need to cut this down. It isn't competing for moisture or sunlight now that it's dead. It provides a good source of food for birds such as woodpeckers, for the insects that are chewing on the wood. And as the woodpeckers work on it, they sometimes make large enough cavities that some kinds of songbirds can use those for, for homes. Jim, this is an area where the timber has been thinned to try to remove any coal trees, that is, low-value species or damaged trees that won't grow to make good lumber. This also has a good effect for wildlife. It causes uh, small shrubs and trees. This is a little hickory sprout to come up. This makes for good deer browse. They can browse on the, the bud, the twig. Rabbits can browse on this. is aromatic shumac. Forest fire is a part of the history of much of this nation's timberland. Forest fire set by nature, but mostly by man. Forest fires can do serious damage to the environment. First of all, the leaf litter, which is timberland's source of organic matter and much of its fertility, is destroyed. Small trees are often killed back. Large trees are damaged and degraded, and sometimes they're killed. The cover for wildlife is usually destroyed. And finally, soil erosion sets in. Five, one, eight. Bob, I think you've got this fire in pretty good shape. Lake Ozark, 540. What type of pine tree do you think would be suitable for the urban area? Well, in Missouri, shortleaf pine is really the only native, but in most of Missouri, uh, there's basically four species that have been planted, and that's scotch pine, white pine, Austrian, and red pine. And those have been widely used. There's a few problems with those species, but all in all, they're probably the most suited for planting. We try to help city officials and planners select trees that are more resistant to air pollution, salt runoff, and poor soil conditions. This tree's about 20 years old. How do you think it's doing in the urban setting? Well, when trying to determine the health of a tree, the diameter is usually a good indication, once you do know the age of the tree, of how it's doing. Uh, good growth is up to one or two inches of diameter per year. And another good indication is just to visually inspect the plant. I think trees are an important part of the urban landscape. They release oxygen into the atmosphere, provide homes for wildlife, and are a constant reminder of our natural heritage. Missouri has changed a lot in the last 200 years. 
the wild land that challenged the pioneers has mostly been tamed. Today's landscape is dominated by agriculture, by cities and roads and reservoirs. But there are still a few wild areas left, areas that are natural and undisturbed. Natural areas remain undeveloped. They're places where scientists can study natural processes. They can study the natural world. But more than just for scientists, they're places for hiking, for nature photography. The Missouri Natural Area System was set up to protect some of these special wild places. Taking kids on nature walks gives them first-hand experience with wildlife and forests, especially urban kids who may never get the opportunity to see creatures in the wild. This also gives them a chance to develop an awareness and respect for the outdoors. Now when he sticks that tongue out, you know what he's doing? He's, he's smelling. That's what he's doing. Snakes smell a lot. That's how they find out what's going on, different types of smells. You don't do that too much. People use their eyes mostly. Hopefully, these kids will leave here knowing there is a natural world out there, one that needs conserving, and that's good. Sing conservation, let us sing. Sing, sing conservation, let us sing. Sing, sing conservation and live it every day. We must protect our fields and woodlands, our lakes and rivers too. For they're the homes of fish and wildlife that belong to me and you. So let us learn, learn, learn to use them wisely. Let us learn, learn, learn to use them wisely. Let us learn, learn. Let us sing, sing, sing conservation. Let us sing, sing, sing conservation. Let us sing, sing, 
sing conservation and live in every day. Conservation can be defined as a planned management of a natural resource. It can also be defined as the wise use of a natural resource or a renewable resource. Renewable resources are vegetation and wildlife. Preservation can be defined as no use of a natural resource. That which is not used as far as wildlife is concerned is wasted. Populations reach a high level. Those that are not utilized are lost to diseases and starvation. We have a term that we use, it's called carrying capacity. And the definition of carrying capacity is how much wildlife a given area of land will support. And in order to make sure healthy animals pass through the winter, what do we do? Let's take deer as an example. We harvest some of them. We harvest the excess or that which would be over the population that would ensure good winter survival. We do this every year. It's a cycle.